Good morning, saints. Happy Sabbath. Have you been blessed this morning already? I know I have. I just want to thank the Lord for this morning's program, for everyone who's involved, because it has lent itself to what I've prayed to share with you this morning. Uh, by a show of hands, who here was at the uh, Southwestern Week of Prayer on Tuesday morning? Anybody? Manny? Well, the message that I shared there is what I'm going to share with you today with a little bit added because we have a little more time. Um, so you're going to get a double blessing of that message for those of you that were there. Sometimes we need to hear things twice. Amen? Uh, so I ask this morning that you would pray for me and pray for yourselves that God's message would be clear and that we would be receptive to it. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it's your time. Amen. The title of this message is The Cure. According to the Center for Disease Control, in 2013, an estimated 198 million cases of malaria occurred worldwide, and 500,000 people died. Now, that number is much lower than it used to be, right? The World Health Organization reports that increased efforts have dramatically reduced the malaria burden in many places. Between 2000 and 2015, malaria death rates fell by 60% globally among all age groups. Amen. However, while organizations such as these appear to be gaining ground against the fight against malaria, an even deadlier disease continues to claim the lives of millions. Now this disease is unpreventable. It's contracted at birth and has a 100% mortality rate. Reliable data also reveals that every person on this planet is infected with the deadly virus. What is this disease that we all have? Is what the Bible calls sin. It is the disease of rebellion and selfishness. And it's very real. It is killing us morally or has, spiritually speaking. It is killing us physically. It is why we die, right? Sin uh, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, separated man from God. And because God had to drive them out, they were not able to take from the tree of life. Because we don't have immortality in of ourselves, right? And so it's the reason why we die. It is very, very real and very serious. Have you been diagnosed with this disease in your life? Have you seen the symptoms? How many here, or who here hasn't, seeing the selfishness in our hearts and in our lives and the things that go on in the world today. This disease is the reason why there are pedophiles and rapists and murderers and for all the terrible things that are going on in our world is because of this disease that you and I all have. In fact, I've heard it said before in a sermon referring to people like Hitler that we have the same disease that he had. The difference is only in the degree, perhaps, but the substance is the same. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, as we read this morning, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible continues to tell us in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin, that the outcome of our disease is death. But is that where the text ends? Amen. It doesn't end there, right? Please say the rest of it with me. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters, that gift of God is the cure. It's your cure and my cure for our disease of rebellion and selfishness. Today's teaching deals with uh, two parts of God's cure for the human condition. The Bible tells us in similar language that God's salvation, righteousness by faith, comes in two parts. First, God declares us righteous. 
And then he makes us righteous. Amen? I've heard it said also that God making us righteous is our fitness to live in heaven. Would you agree? Amen? However, God declaring us righteous is our ticket for heaven. Do you want your ticket today, brothers and sisters? Do you want to be made fit to live in heaven? I know I do. Do you want the cure for your disease? Praise the Lord. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, please. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 20. We have four main points that we're going to look at this morning. How many points? Four main points. The first point is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, and it is this. In no way is it possible for us to earn the cure. We must engage it by faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul makes it very clear in this verse that we cannot be justified before God, that we cannot be declared righteous by our own deeds of the law. I'd like to read a verse to you that's found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. You can go there with me if you'd like, but hold your place in Romans chapter 3 because we're going to come back to it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 9. Listen to what Paul says. If anyone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But listen to what he says. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And he goes on to say that he considered those things that once were gains to him, garbage. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which according to verse 20 is not going to pass judgment, right? But a righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. If it were possible for us to earn this cure, this salvation, by our own deeds of the law, if anyone could have done that, it would have been Paul, right? But what did he say? He counted it all garbage. That reminds me of a text in Isaiah 64 verse 4 that says that we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 20. We're still on this first point. In no way is it possible for us to earn the cure. We must engage it by faith. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What is Paul referring to when he says that this righteousness of God, which is apart from the law, is revealed by the law and the prophets? He's referring to the Old Testament, the law being the first five books, and then the prophets, the other writings in Scripture. And in fact... He gives us an example if we drop down to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. He gives us the example of Abraham. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. By a show of hands, who here has a job or has ever worked and received a paycheck? By a show of hands. Praise God. Amen. When you receive your paycheck at the end of the week or biweekly or monthly, when your employer gives you that pay, they're not doing you any favors. Amen? 
In other words, they're not giving you a gift, right? You've earned that money. At least I hope you have. <laughs> what Paul is saying is that if we could earn this cure, if we could earn salvation, then it wouldn't be a gift. God would owe it to us. But that's not the truth, is it? We've already seen that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And in fact, Romans chapter 3, verse 24 tells us that those that are being justified are justified how? Freely. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Please say it with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see very clearly in this first point that in no way is it possible for us to earn salvation, to earn the cure. We must engage it how? By faith. Now let's look back at Romans chapter 3 and we'll see point number 2 as we continue on in verses 22 and 23. Amen? Are we there, saints? Yes. Amen. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. John chapter 3, verse 16. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Brothers and sisters, we are the whosoevers. Amen? This cure is offered to all and on all who believe. Have you ever been lucky enough to receive one of those advertisements from those uh, you know, big sales events at an auto dealership? Have you ever got one of those? They usually come with a key already on it. I usually take it off and give it to my son to play with. Uh, they come with a check and it's got your name on it and making big claims to come down and claim your prize. You are a winner. I usually just throw them away because they're all the same. Everybody's a winner, right? They just want you to come down. However, being in college, I followed up on the last couple. <laughs> I thought, you know, maybe somebody's got to win, right? So I followed up on it. And what I always thought was true was the case. You know what the salesman told me? He said, you haven't won anything. We just want to get you down here and sell you a car. <laughs> That's what he told me. Brothers and sisters, when God says that you can be a winner in Christ Jesus, he means what he says. It's not like those false advertisements that make big promises and don't follow through. When he says that this cure is to all and on all who believe, that means you, if you will engage it by faith. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 tells us that our God is a perfect Savior, that Jesus Christ is able to save to the uttermost, completely, perfectly, all that come to God through Him. And so brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what you've done in your life, how your life has gone. It does not matter. This cure is available to you today if you will receive it. Amen. Now let's continue on in Romans chapter 3 and we'll look at our third point. Romans chapter 3 and it's in verse 24. And when you found it, please say amen. 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 So we're all together. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption of that is in who? Christ. Christ Jesus. A third point is that God's cure, His salvation, is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said of Himself in John 14, verse 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus purchased our salvation. We, we saw in the first point that it was free to us, but it cost Jesus, right? 
He purchased our salvation, our cure, by laying his life down on the cross for our sins. Isaiah the prophet spoke of him in Isaiah 53 verse 5 when he said, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. There's a cure in Jesus Christ for you today. Amen? I want to read to you from Faith and Works. In fact, I have a few things I want to read to you from here, but uh, the first one is found on page 25. This is what Ellen White says on page 25. This is a compilation of all her um, journals and writings on this topic. When men learn they cannot earn righteousness by their own merit of works, and they look with firm and entire reliance upon Jesus Christ as their only hope, there will not be so much of self and so little of Jesus. Souls and bodies are defiled and polluted by sin. The heart is estranged from God, and yet many are struggling in their own finite strength to win salvation by good works. Jesus, they think, will do some of the saving, and they must do the rest. They need to see by faith the righteousness of Christ as their only hope for time and eternity. Amen. If you want to be cured from your disease of selfishness and sin, then there's only one place where you can go, and that is to Jesus Christ. For salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven, uh, under heaven given to mankind, whereby which we must be saved. Amen? Now, go back to Romans chapter 3, and we'll see our last point. Romans chapter 3, and we'll look at verses 27 and 31. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. This truth of Scripture should humble us today, amen? There's an even plane at the cross, right? We're all on the same level. Look, let's look at verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. See, God doesn't just want to declare you righteous. He wants to make you righteous. Amen? His cure is not just to forgive you for your sins, but to save you from your sins. To cure you. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. Verses 8 through 12. And when you found it, please let me know by saying amen. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. Amen. I'm going to go ahead. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen? Amen? Let's look at one more text in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. By the way, do you believe that Christ Jesus was raised from the dead? Amen. Amen. Well, then listen what it says. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, 
certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Brothers and sisters, don't let anybody tell you that Jesus came on the expensive errand that he did to die only to forgive you and to leave you in your sin. That is not the whole truth. The Bible tells us that God is able to keep you from stumbling. Do you believe this? You remember the story in John chapter 8 where Jesus, the woman that was caught in adultery, he told her first what? He, I don't condemn you. But then what did he say? Go sin no more. And our Heavenly Father would not make a command that He would not enable us to do. I want to read to you something also found in Faith and Works. It tells us that sanctification is obtained only in the obedience to the will of God. Many who are willfully trampling upon the law of Jehovah claim holiness of heart and sanctification of life, but they have not a saving knowledge of God or of his law. They are standing in the ranks of the great rebel. He is at war with the law of God, which is the foundation of the divine government in heaven and in earth. These men are doing the same work as their master has done in seeking to make of none effect God's holy law. No commandment breaker can be permitted to enter heaven. So what does that mean then right there? That means that those are going to go. God is able to, to keep them from stumbling. Amen? Amen? For he who has once a pure and exalted covering cherub was thrust out of for rebellion against the government of God. With many, sanctification is only self-righteousness. And yet these persons boldly claim Jesus as their Savior and sanctifier. What a delusion. Will the Son of God sanctify the transgressor of the Father's law, the law which Christ came to exalt and to make honorable? And what Paul says that we should, um, he says that we should um, establish. He testifies, I have kept my Father's commandments. God will not bring his law down to meet the imperfect standard of man and man cannot meet the demands of the holy law without exercising repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. Two stories and then we close. Story number one is found in Exodus chapter 14. You don't have to go there. You know the story. The Israelites are leaving Egypt. They're following after Christ who's in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And the Lord guides them to the Red Sea. And then what happens? Remember? Pharaoh's army's coming, right? And they're caught between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. And they cannot make it out by themselves. Listen to what God says to them. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. The second story is the story of Jonah. Now Jonah, unlike the Israelites who are following after God, Jonah's doing what? He's running away from God. He gets on a ship. God sends the storm. Eventually he's tossed overboard by the sailors. And as he's drowning, God sends a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah spends three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Now you tell me, is there any possible way for Jonah to make it out of that fish by himself? Alive. Absolutely not. The only way that Jonah was going to get out of that fish by himself was through the fish's digestive system. Right? But Jonah prayed. And he says something powerful in his prayer. He said, salvation belongs to to the Lord or salvation comes from the Lord and God command the fish to swim ashore and to vomit Jonah out I don't know where you are in this thing if you are running to God or if you're running away from God but either way like the people in these stories you cannot save yourself 
You need Jesus. And Jesus came to not just forgive you for your sin, but to give you victory over sin. Amen? Do you believe this? Amen. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, that behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. I just would like to ask the elders to come forward and pastor. And I want to make an appeal. We're going to sing the first stanza of our song. So if uh, Beth, would you come up please and Malaya? I've done my part. I've studied, I've prepared, I've prayed, and I've shared the message that God had put on my heart to share with you today. But God may not be finished. I want to give an opportunity for if there's anyone in this congregation today that has heard this message, that God has a cure to heal you from your disease of sin. That it's for you. It's available. If you've heard that message today and you want to accept it, then I ask after we sing our song and we'll go through the rest of the, the closing song and prayer. And for those of you that need to go, uh, the ushers will usher you out as normal. But if you want to come forward, we're going to be here and we'd like to pray with you. This is not about us. We want to give God an opportunity if he has touched your heart today and you want to respond, then we ask that you would come forward uh, as we, after we close out the program. Let's sing our, our closing song. <coughs>